Hello and welcome to a seminario. Today we have Victor Zavala. He is the Valdovin Dapra Associate Professor in the Department of Chemical and Biological Engineering at the University of Wisconsin-Madison and a computational mathematician in the Mathematics and Computer Science Division at Argonne National Laboratory. He holds a bachelor degree from Universidad Iberoamericana and a PhD degree from Carnegie Mellon University, both in chemical engineering. Um, among many accomplishments, he's a recipient of the NSF and DOE Early Career Awards and of the Presidential Early Career Award for Scientists and Engineers. Thank you very much, Victor, for joining us today. Great, so yeah, thank you so much for inviting me. A very nice initiative. So, uh, so yeah, today I'll, I'll give you a quick overview of some of the sustainability challenges that we're facing in the dairy industry. So this is a, a topic, of course, that is very close to our hearts here in Wisconsin because we have a very prominent dairy industry. So, um, so I'd like to start motivating the problem just to kind of giving, giving you some interesting numbers of where things are uh, uh, becoming a problem, right? So, and I'd like to start by posing this little question. So how many gallons of uh, per year of ice cream do you think that an average American uh, will consume? So. Um, Probably you can just type it up in the chat box. You can decide if it's one gallon, five gallons, or five gallons, uh, seven gallons. And I think that in the chat, uh, Claudia is saying that it's uh, be five gallons. Uh, very good, Claudia. So that's the correct answer. So of course, this is a distribution, right? And this is the type of distribution that has a very uh, long tail and heavy tail, right? Because uh, there are people that consume a lot of ice cream, and a lot of people that consume very little ice cream, right? but per capita is around five gallons per year. Um, so uh, the largest consumer of, uh, of ice cream in the world is actually New Zealand, which is quite intriguing. And also Australia is their number three, right? So, uh, so there's, we, we enjoy the, right, the products of the dairy industry, ice cream, cheese, right? Milk, yogurt, they're essential products for our daily lives, right? So very important uh, uh, industry. And now, uh, if you want to put this in perspective of how much uh, milk you actually need to produce ice cream, uh, that gets a little bit more complicated, but this gives you some interesting insight. An average cow uh, nowadays will actually produce around 2,700 gallons per year of milk. That is a single cow. So just think about that in from a perspective, like uh, how um, important these animals are, right? Like they produce quite a bit of milk. And then if you were to put this on an ice cream basis, that would be around 900 gallons per year of ice cream. So that means that one cow produces enough milk to give ice cream to 180 people, right? So that tells you how big this animal is, right? It's a, it's a big animal, right? It can feed a lot, of, a lot of people. But unfortunately, as with any industry, right? You typically produce these desirable products, but you also produce a lot of undesirable products, right? And like with any living organism, you produce a lot of organic waste, which colloquially is called manure, right? So uh, the striking number, and the first time that I heard about this, uh, this kind of blew my mind, an average cow will produce 20 tons of manure per year. Um, I don't mean to ruin your ice cream kind of uh, dreams, but if you were to put it on the perspective of ice cream that I think is important, uh, this is around four gallons of manure per gallon of ice cream. So again, I don't want to ruin it, but it's important for us as consumers to realize how much waste is produced for these desirable products that we have. And once we start thinking about it that way, it's not that we're going to stop consuming them, but also just being mindful about the, the environmental uh, consequences of that production process, right? Now, that is just for a single cow, right? So that's 20 tons of manure per year. And now if you think about it, you have 1.2 million cows in the state of Wisconsin. Uh, we have 9 million in the United States. So that means in Wisconsin, we have quite a big chunk of the population. So what is the environmental problems that, that manure will generate? So the big issue with manure, it is a very complex and very rich uh, waste stream. So it pollutes water and it pollutes the air, okay? So in terms of water, what happens is that uh, manure contains a lot of nutrients, phosphorus and nitrogen. And as some of you know, those nutrients are very important to grow crops. 
And as a typical thing, what farmers will do is precisely take the manure from the cows and just apply it to the land as fertilizer because they're trying to recycle those uh, nutrients. The problem is that the balance of those nutrients is not perfect for all the crops. So what ends up happening is that phosphorus is over applied for most crops and then you get an accumulation of phosphorus and we're gonna look into that in a second. So those, that excess phosphorus will end up in the lakes. And that's some of the problems that we're starting to see in the lakes here in Wisconsin. We'll also talk a little bit about that later. Now, the second issue with manure is that it contains organic matter. When this organic matter uh, remains in the manure and this is applied in the field, uh, bacteria will start degrading it and it will release methane. And methane is a very powerful greenhouse gas. So it's 30 times more potent than CO2. So uh, that's a, a huge uh, um, uh, pollutant, okay? So now the interesting thing is that you can say, well, all those nutrients and all that organic matter can actually potentially be used for something, right? So for example, in in instead of just leaking this methane into the atmosphere, how about we can uh, capture it? And then if we can capture it, then we can use it as natural gas, right? Uh, just to give you some perspective of all the manure that you produce in the state, that will give you enough methane to power 8 million homes. So that means that it's a non-negligible amount of energy that you could be uh, recycling, right? Or, or capturing, if you were to capture this methane. And that's precisely what a lot of research is right now focused on. So people are interested in taking the manure and say, well, instead of leaking it into the water bodies or the air, we're gonna pass it through some technologies to try to recover the organic matter and the nutrients, right? So there's a technique that is called anaerobic digesters, so which is this very big tank where bacteria are degrading the manure in a controlled environment. So that can be used to recover fertilizer with a certain um, um, nutrients, and also can be used to recover biofuel like methane and electricity and all these valuable products. So this sounds very cool, right? Very, uh, very exciting. But the problem is that we actually don't have this many technologies here. The fundamental problem is that this is a waste stream. Manure is a waste stream. Um, putting an economic value to a waste stream is actually typically a difficult problem. So as a result, there are no well-established markets for these waste streams. So just to give you some idea, some farmers tend to think of manure as a positive um, value, right? So they say, well, this manure actually has value. Some of them think of it as a negative value. They say, you know what, this manure, I don't want it. I want to get rid of it, right? So there's all these interesting dynamics into how people perceive the economics of waste. And this is not unique to manure. This also happens with plastic waste and other types of waste like food waste, for example. So, so we as humans have weird ways on, on kind of perceiving the value of, of these waste streams. But another fundamental problem with, with this that is blocking the deployment of all these technologies is that transportation of manure is very complicated. 93% of manure is actually water. So that means that you need to transport it in pipes. But the problem is that we have all these farms that are dispersed all over the country and the state, right? So it's very difficult to transport all this water through pipelines, right? We, we just don't have pipes similar to what we do in a city, right? And that really complicates the problem. So that means that if you wanna move manure around, you're gonna need to do trucks and things like that. And those things are very expensive and they're difficult to move around, okay? Now, another issue that has been happening in recent years is that automation is transforming the dairy industry. So typically farms have the tendency to want to consolidate into big farms. Just to give you some perspective, back in 1960, we had around 100,000 dairy farms in the state. Right now, around the 2020, we have around 9,000 uh, farms in the state, but we have the same number of cows. So what that means is that if you keep the same number of cows, right, those is constant, but you're decreasing the number of farms, that means that you're concentrating them, right? So these are big dairy farms that are concentrating a lot of, farm, uh, a lot of animals. And this is not an accident that dairy farms are looking into this. When you consolidate operations, you become more efficient, you become more profitable. One could argue that this is one of the reasons why our milk is actually cheap, why our ice cream is affordable, because the dairy industry has become more efficient. But from an environmental perspective, this creates a big issue because precisely if you consolidate animals, then you consolidate the production of waste of manure, and then you don't have good economics for transporting it back to where it was uh, different locations, right? And then what happens is the manure keeps concentrating in different areas. 
And this is manifested in a lot of environmental impacts that we currently have in the state. So if you look at a map of Wisconsin and you look at the phosphorus concentration in the soil, you're gonna see that this is creating these hotspots. And this is a Wisconsin area. This is the Yahara watershed. There are some parts in the state that are heavily contaminated. And this is not an accident. So if you actually look at the locations of the farms, they're actually the big farms are actually located in those regions, right? So when you have phosphorus accumulating close to the lakes, every time that there's rainfall, every time that there's a melting of ice and things like that, there's gonna be runoff into the lakes, right? And that's inevitable. And the phosphorus will also uh, end up in the, in the lakes. I'm gonna skip that thing. And what is interesting about phosphorus is that it not only leaks to the nearby lakes, but they're actually very sophisticated watershed networks, right, in, uh, in the country um, that uh, will actually take this phosphorus to faraway places. So if I show you a map of phosphorus pollution in the, in the country, you're gonna see something like this. So you're gonna see that this area in the Midwest is heavily, heavily uh, uh, polluted in uh, phosphorus, okay? Can someone tell me why do you think that phosphorus is um, uh, probably accumulating in that region. Anyone has any idea of why that might be the case? That particular region of the US, any ideas? You can put it in the chat or you can unmute yourselves. I'm happy to wanna see if people are awake. Yeah, no idea, Claude said no idea. So what is interesting there is that the Mississippi River is going there, okay? So we have these mountainous regions over here. Everything is going downhill in this region. Everything is coming down to the Mississippi River and that's precisely what I'm showing you here. So that means that all these watersheds are actually connected. Iowa, uh, Minnesota, Wisconsin, Illinois, they're connected to the Mississippi. And the Mississippi is gonna operate as, uh, that's what Dirty was mentioning, very good. So watersheds going towards west of Chicago, exactly. So, uh, so these watersheds are all connected. So you can think this as a, as a highway, right? Where phosphorus will start leaking eventually. And you're gonna see this phosphorus going into this um, complicated, um, uh, in complicated ways to the Mississippi River. And that means that once the phosphorus gets in there, it will get propagated all the way down to the Gulf of Mexico. And recently there has been reports of all sorts of pollution in the country as a result of this. So these algae blooms that we're seeing in Madison, right? So this is the terrace here in Madison, is the result of phosphorus accumulation over decades of dairy uh, uh, activity. But this is not unique of Wisconsin. This is the Lake Erie close to Pennsylvania. Um, so we have problems with algae blooms everywhere, right? And this is the result of intense agriculture. Uh, so if I show you a map of the US, you're gonna see all these places uh, have problems with, um, with uh, algae blooms, okay? And this is a global problem because you might say, well, this is unique to the US, but no, turns out that if these nutrients start leaking into the Gulf of Mexico, then they get propagated to different places, right? So this was an incident that happened in Cancun, in Mexico in, in the summer of 2018. So all of a sudden there was this bloom of sargassum, which is a weed that uh, tanked the, econo the economy of Cancun at that time. Tons and tons of this thing that they have to bring tractors and everything to pull it up. And the reason for this, this is actually generated by the Mississippi River. So actually these nutrients are actually getting carried over the currents here. And turns out that people have found out that these things are getting carried all the way to Africa. So this is a global problem, right? So all the nutrient pollution we have in the state, in the United States, is actually affecting other communities and, and all over the, the world, if you wanna think about it that way. So the type of work that I do in my research, and I just spent a few minutes talking about that, is just trying to look at optimization techniques, systems engineering techniques, to try to understand how do we recover these nutrients, what type of technologies exist, what is the most economically efficient way of doing it, and how do we move around this waste in efficient ways? Because ultimately it's a mobility of, of nutrients uh, if you wanna uh, uh, solve the problem. I'm not gonna go into the details of this, but just to give you a perspective of how our models look like. So we'll solve optimization problems that are trying to design supply chains, try to figure out where are we gonna place technologies to recover these nutrients. 
So there are a lot of technologies nowadays that people are considering like little wastewater treatment plants that you can put at the dairy farms. People are considering a uh, recovery of nutrients through algae, uh, through algae cultivation. Uh, people are looking into estrubite recovery, all sorts of different technologies. So we're trying to analyze where do we place them and how do we can move, how can we move manure and the and the and the products around, right? And you want to do it in a way that it benefits people so that it's not a big penalty to farmers, so that people can make money. So those are the types of questions that, that we're trying to answer. And ultimately, we're using these models to understand why this hasn't happened, right? Like, why are we facing all these problems? Why this, why this problem is, is still around, right? And when you do the market analysis uh, and you through these models, you start finding out that this is not an accident. So what ends up happening is that the products that you can recover from manure have very low value compared to the break-even value, the, the amount of money that you will actually need to collect in order for these technologies to become viable, right? So one example is electricity. So the break-even value for electricity for most facilities to recover this methane is around uh, 18 cents uh, per uh, kilowatt hour. So that's the amount of money that you will need to pay the facility for this technology to be viable. But you see that the current market value, uh, what, it, what they're getting paid is around four cents. So that means that farmers do not have an incentive to do it, right? And the story is very different in places like Germany, for example, where they have a lot of technologies installed for this, because in that country, they get paid much more. They get paid like 20 to 30 cents per kilowatt hour, right? And then you can do a similar analysis for other types of products like biomethane, nutrients, struvite, uh, phosphorus, all these types of things. And you're gonna find similar story. There's always a gap in this thing. So what that means is that there has to be government intervention if we want to uh, deploy these technologies. And those are the types of things that we're evaluating. So we're working with the Environmental Protection Agency, trying to understand what type of incentives uh, they will need to provide for these technologies to become valuable. So for example, right, right now, there are incentives like phosphorus credits, where in certain parts of the, of, the, of the United States, they're actually offering a certain amount of money for every pound of phosphorus that you can recover at your farm, and you will get, get paid for that, right? So it's like providing a service to society. So we're uh, using these models to analyze those type of incentives. Um, the other thing that we're doing is try to understand if we can actually create a waste market. The fundamental problem here with waste is that this is a complex problem. And we tend to think of interactions between farmers and different technologies on a peer-to-peer -peer basis. If we keep going with that type of approach, we're never going to solve the problem because the problem is too complex. So one of the things that we're trying to advocate is actually that we need to create a market for waste where it's a coordinated market where people are offering the waste, where people uh, more clearly see the value of those waste streams and of the derived products. And that's another type of uh, research that we're actually uh, working on. And some people say, well, will this actually gain traction, right? And it turns out that, yes, there's a lot of discussion right now at the state level on creating these type of markets, coordinated markets. Uh, so for example, recently the GOP here in the, in the state started uh, considering creating a market uh, for phosphorus trading. So uh, similar to C uh, carbon trading uh, that has, has been happening, phosphorus is also becoming um, uh, a possibility, right? So maybe in the future we can do that. So I just wanna conclude the technical part of my talk just by giving you a quick case study just to show you like how these things work. So, um, so one of the case studies that we have is trying to balance phosphorus in the Yahara watershed. So this is Madison, this is one of our lakes. And these are some of the dairy farms that we have in the region. And what we want to kind of investigate is what will happen if we want to install some of these technologies around Madison, uh, how much nutrients we could capture, can we balance uh, the amount of nutrients that we have in the region so that we don't get an oversupply of phosphorus. And, and our model suggests that it is indeed possible, but it is important to create an incentive for this to happen as, we, as I was discussing. So the idea here is that we want to treat uh, the environment as a stakeholder. So one of the things that we've been uh, advocating for is that lakes actually have rights, if you want to think about it that way. And this is nothing like a crazy idea. It turns out that if you look at this article over here, it's precisely trying to 
advocate that uh, someone has to defend these water bodies, right? Because they don't, they don't, no one else defends them, right? So if you think about the lake as a, as a stakeholder that participates into this market, turns out that you can actually activate an economy that will actually uh, help uh, balance these phosphorus in the region. And some of the things that we have seen, for example, is that if you keep doing the business as usual, then we're gonna still see this phosphorus pollution in the region. If all of the sudden the lake starts participating as a stakeholder and says, you know what, I'm gonna charge you $45 per kilogram of phosphorus that you dump on me, all of the sudden, like we have incentives for these technologies to be installed. So this is again, trying to send a message that uh, lakes have rights, we, can, we need to respect them, right? And we need to find policy that actually defends uh, the water bodies. Uh, otherwise, we're never going to solve the problem. Okay. Uh, the last thing is that we created a video game. So if you have, uh, if you want to play it, so we created a, a game that precisely teaches uh, kids and also everyone uh, what are the issues with nutrient pollution in the region. So we call this uh, video game Lakeland. So, um, so yeah, so that's kind of uh, the, the, the research portion of my talk. And then um, I really like this initiative um, that Claudia and uh, Daniel was telling me about. So just to tell you a little bit about my Latin X background. So I am originally from Mexico. So um, I was born in a very hot and humid place in Mexico that is called Minatitlan, Veracruz. It's very close to this other city called Coatzacoalcos. So the story is that my dad worked for a chemical company for all his life. He's an accountant, he's not a chemical engineer, but he worked for the chemical company and Quetzalcoatlcos is a very prominent area for, for that. And um, so I was born in a place like this, like a hundred degrees, 90% humidity all the time. And then um, then eventually we moved because of the, of the, um, of the company moving, moving us around. So then we moved to central Mexico. So my family is actually originally from this state, so Guanajuato. This is a picture of Guanajuato from the capital. So it's one of the most beautiful little towns in Mexico. Uh, for those that have not been to Mexico, I strongly recommend it. Very easy to access, beautiful. One of the largest expat communities of Americans is actually around that area in a little town called San Miguel Allende. So, um, so yeah, very, very beautiful place. So I strongly recommend it. And then uh, we lived there a couple of times. We kind of rotated between these two locations multiple times. And then at some point we converged around Mexico City. So a little town called Metepec. So that's where my parents live still. So it's also a very nice uh, little historical town, uh, beautiful art. So one of the things uh, that they do there is this tree of life. So it's a very colorful tree of life, very expensive ones, uh, but very, very nice. So. Um, and then they make it out of clay. Some, some of these uh, um, uh, arrangements will take over a year to be made. So they're made by hand and the artists put a lot of effort in them and they're beautiful. Uh, and so it's a very nice place to go visit. And then I eventually uh, went to Mexico City for college just because of the proximity here to uh, Metepec. So, uh, so that's where I, where I went. And then the, another thing that typically people ask me is uh, what was my journey into science? So as I said, I, uh, I got my undergraduate degree in Mexico City. It's uh, at, a, at a place called Universidad Iberoamericana. So I'm starting to pronounce it like American, so it's Iberoamericana. Um, so it's a small Jesuit school, uh, similar to Loyola Gonzaga. So it's part of the Jesuit network, um, 9,000 students. So it's a, it's a nice uh, place. Then after that, I uh, graduated in chemical engineering, came to the US to get a PhD in chemical engineering at Carnegie Mellon. Uh, I worked for Exxon in between for the chemical industry. Then I went to Argonne National Lab, which is a department of energy lab. I was there a computational mathematician. And then I moved to Madison, uh, retained my affiliation at Argonne, so I now have two bosses around. So, uh, so I've been in Madison for the last six years. So that's in a nutshell, so yeah, I have a, family to kids and uh, have also uh, other activities that I like to do. But um, so this is where I'm gonna stop. And, uh, and if you have any questions about the research part or the Latinx part, uh, more than happy to answer any questions you might have.